Welcome to this presentation in which we're going to discuss loose leaf services and um, administrative law materials. So here we are on Canvas. Let's go down to the module that we're working on today and that is module nine and you'll see in here we do have a PowerPoint so be sure to look at that. I'll be covering the PowerPoint today. Probably about half of our time will be spent on the PowerPoint, maybe even less. And then I'm going to take you on to some additional resources and finally on to Westlaw. So let's get started. So here's our PowerPoint. I'm uh, going to just go through all of the PowerPoints and then go back and look at the um, uh, links that we we are, uh, will see are covered in this PowerPoint. So this is about administrative materials and loose leaf services. Um, administrative materials are those uh, legal proceedings and documents related to legal proceedings that happen within regulatory agencies. So whenever you see the term administrative law, you're really talking about regulatory law. And this can be on the state or federal level. So how do we get uh, regulatory agencies? How do they come into existence? Well, what is required is that the legislative branch, obviously it's the Congress, if it's the federal legislative branch, or um, it is uh, the equivalent of our two houses, or you know, the Senate and the House in our Texas legislative branch. Anyway, one or the other of those develops uh, the idea that we need a new administrative or regulatory agency. And so they create what's called enabling statutes. Now those statutes need to become law. And once they become law, then there is the capacity for um, that agency to come into existence. The enabling statute is what gives that agency its marching orders. It tells the agency what it can do, what it can't do, what it has to do. It really gives it, you know, kind of its, its uh, rule book, so to speak. And there's lots of different names that these agencies will have, um, bureaus, boards, commissions, lots of different things. What the agency is going to do when it comes into existence is establish some type of rules, and usually we call those rules regulations. And usually what they are is they are a more granular or more detailed version of that enabling statute. For example, the enabling statute might say something like, let's say the enabling statute that created the Environmental Protection Agency. It would say things like, the role of the Environmental Protection Agency is to make sure that we have clean water and clean air. But it's not really going to get into the details of what qualifies as clean water or clean air. It doesn't do that because, honestly, congressmen and women are not experts in what qualifies as clean in this context. It's a really complex scientific issue. And so then they say, well, let's create this agency and this agency will hire lots of scientists and doctors and experts in this area and they will perform tests and then they will establish standards. And those standards will be very detailed. You know, how many parts per billion of this particular chemical can be in the water or can be in the air or whatever. And so those regulations are just a fleshing out of the standard that the statute created. In addition to creating regulations, many of these statutes have kind of like a quasi-judicial function. They will have people that are called ALJs, which stands for Administrative Law Judge, and they actually have hearings. Because imagine for a second that the Administ uh, Environmental Protection Agency, for example, created an, uh, a regulation that says you can't have more than X number of particles per million of benzene or whatever. And let's say some company didn't follow those rules and it uh, released more of that chemical than was lawful. Well, um, there is going to be obviously some repercussion for that company. And the, the first step typically in that situation is that the company will have to defend itself in front of that administrative agency. Some uh, employee of that agency will kind of act as a prosecutor. It may be the same person who investigated it initially, or it could be someone else. And then the company will obviously have representation and witnesses will be allowed to be presented and various test results will be allowed to be presented. And all this will be done before an administrative law judge who works for the agency. But let's say the administrative law agency, excuse me, the administrative law judge rules against the company. Well, the company will have the opportunity to appeal that decision to a federal court. 
Um, and so there is a check outside the agency where the company can get an independent review. So the agency kind of has three functions. It has the investigative function. It finds out if people are not following the rules. It has a legislative function in that it is actually establishing the rules. And it has a judicial function. It enforces those rules once those rules they believe are being broken. So really within that one agency, they have the three functions of government legislative like Congress, investigative like the executive function of the executive branch, and judicial kind of like the court system. So it's kind of interesting, it's kind of a microcosm of our legal system. So where do we find regulations? Uh, we don't spend a lot of time talking about regulations in this course, but there are lots of practice areas where regulations are where their game is. That's where you really uh, spend most of your time kind of in the weeds understanding what these regulations permit and don't permit. And so if you're in one of those practice areas, the resources I'm going to show you in a few minutes, and I have the links listed down here, are going to be things that you become very familiar with. Um, the, uh, the regulations that exist and that are being created are available in the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. They're initially published in the Federal Register. Um, and as you can imagine, when new regulations come out, well, first of all, they appear on the internet, obviously, then the register gets printed and that gets sent out. And so people get that shortly afterwards. But obviously, uh, the internet is faster than the register. Well, the register is also online. And so you can see the stuff almost as soon as the regulations issue. And then those, uh, uh, that Federal Register, the information that comes out uh, very, I don't know, once a month or twice a month or something like that, that uh, those sets of regulations then are ultimately put in that larger book called the Code of Federal Regulations. You know, obviously in a particular register, you'll have regulations from maybe all 29 or 30 or 40 or 50 of the titles that exist in the federal system. But you want to have all the stuff that's relating to labor, for example, uh, organized and put in with all the other labor stuff. So you want to have it ultimately organized or we'll call it codification, although that's not quite the right word for this context. But all, all of the tax stuff put with the other tax stuff, all the labor stuff put with the other labor stuff. Just like we talked about when we were talking about the statutes in the last module. So they come out as paper editions. They're also available on Westlaw and we have them again available on the internet, both the government website and also the Cornell Law website, which we've talked about Cornell Law in the past and what a nifty website it is. It's free. And so if you haven't had a chance to spend some time there, there's, they just have a lot, a lot of cool stuff. Uh, I'd say virtually every legal professional spends a little bit of time on this website from time to time. It is a very, very handy website to be familiar with. Um, and here is the Federal Register link. Again, this is a pamphlet that comes out. Oh, well, I guess it's, it's published every day. So silly me and much more frequently than I had said. And again, it's available. You can get it through the Federal Register website or through Lexis or, or Westlaw. And this gives you more granularity about how they're organized and how to retrieve stuff. We already talked about the hearing, so I'm not going to spend time on that. You can get records of those court and agency um, hearings. Um, I can tell you when I was in private practice, I didn't do a lot uh, of ALJ work. Uh, there was one, maybe two big cases that I did that in which I dealt with administrative law judges. But in preparation for that, once we found out who the ALJ was, we did review his decisions in other cases. So we would have an understanding about how he approached cases. And so there are lots of cool internet tools that will give you that information um, in, in a really neat, neat format. Loose leaf services, this name is completely misleading. So let me kind of go back in time and, and tell you what I'm talking about when I talk about loose leaf services. Because once upon, in fact, this was my job for a summer between college and law school. My dad was a client for a law firm. And so he was able to get me a, a pretty sweet job. And I worked for a law firm in the library. And what I did was I updated loose leaf services. So for eight hours a day for, you know, I don't know, 10 weeks, that was my, uh, my, my uh, role. Anyway, so what I did was um, th there were um, 
thick binders, really like three ring binders. They were they were nicer looking than uh, your typical three ring binder, but th that was ba essentially what they were. And they would have, and that was what makes them loose leaf because they were a binder, which means you can open it up and you can take pages in and you can remove pages. And what would happen is uh, you'd you'd have a serve you CCH or BNA. Those are two of the big ones. Matthew Bender's a third big one. They um, would every month, or sometimes more frequently than every month, would send packets of papers, and they would have instructions, and they would tell you, okay, remove pages, you know. 14, 15, and 16, and replace them with pages 14, 1, 14, 2, 14, 3, 14, 4, page 15, page 16, because maybe they needed more pages in that section than uh, when they initially published, they, they thought that they would need. So there was, was an expansion of, of sections and sometimes a contraction of sections. Anyway, um, so these uh, sets were, you know, some, some of them were 30, 40 volumes and there were lots and lots of these different sets. And so it doesn't sound like it would take up a full-time job, but it really was a full-time job to take the pages in and put in, uh, take the pages out or put the pages in, take the pages out. And you'd obviously have to be very careful because you wouldn't want to take a page out that wasn't supposed to come out. Similarly, you wouldn't want to put a page in in the wrong spot because then no one would be able to find it because these books were, of course, huge. And the system was pretty complicated about how you filed it. Uh, it was pretty mind-numbingly boring, but I can remember thinking to myself, at least I'm inside, at least I'm inside, at least it's not hot, right? So that was my, my thought process. So that's what, when people talk about loose leaf services, that's what they're remembering. Remembering. But nobody buys those books anymore. Why would you? Because we've got this wonderful thing called the internet and that has really replaced it. We still call them loose leaf services. I guess we're just creatures of habit, but they really are on the internet. And so nobody's updating it the way I updated it um, because of course the internet, update, internet updates and, and all the old stuff goes away and all the new stuff comes in, into play with a flick of a switch wherever these loose leaf services are located. So loose leaf services have lots of different cool things in them. They're kind of a one-stop shopping place. They will have um, information about regulations, about statutes, they'll have cases, and they'll have written commentary. They'll also, also sometimes have forms. So they really kind of give you everything. And in fact, it wasn't at all uncommon if your practice area was tax law, for example, you might just basically use your CCH as kind of your only resource because it had everything you needed. The CCH and area uh, had a lot of good tax stuff. BNA had a lot of good tax stuff. Um, certain uh, loosely services would specialize in a particular area. And literally, they just kind of had everything. It, it was a very a kind of convenient uh, prepackaged set of materials. Now when I say they have everything, as you can imagine, they would, there would be several, several volumes, but if your area was very narrow, you might have a set that was only you know, three or four volumes of these very thick binders. I mean, each one of the binders might have been four, five, six inches thick, um, and you'd have several of those. So that that's what uh, what I mean when I refer to loose leaf services, but again, they're no longer the loose leaf. Here, I kind of explain that. Um, and these were three prominent ones. I'm not going to be able to show you these because I think uh, Shepherd, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Lexus has most of these services, uh, but they are pretty cool. And the one that I actually have in my office uh, when we're back on campus, which you're welcome to come by, is Dorsanio's. Dorsanio, and I'm not sure if he prefers Dorsanio or Dorsanio's. Uh, but anyway, he is a prominent professor at SMU Law School. I don't know if he still teaches, but he is very, very famous, at least in Texas. Anyway, he has this um, Texas trial practice, Texas litigation Texas Litigation Guide, Texas Litigation Guide, I think is the name of it. That's the name of this set of volumes that he has. They're kind of a baby blue color. I'll show you a picture of them in a second. Anyway, if you were to go to a Texas attorney and say, may I look at your Texas Litigation Guide? He'd probably look at you and go, hmm, what are you talking about? But then you say, hey, can I look at your Dorsani? Oh, of course, you know, or no, you can't look at it, but he'll at least know what you meant because this is one of these cases where, and this is so often true in the law, we, we, we name our textbooks and our, 
our guides and our treatises and our loose leaf services very boring. I mean, they're descriptive names, but they're, they have no pizzazz. And so the names are, are not memorable at all. So oftentimes we call them by the author. And we'll see this. Another big one in Texas is O'Connor's. If you're not using Dorsenia's, you're probably using O'Connor's. If you were to ask the average practitioner, well, what, what is the full name of O'Connor's resources? And there's lots of them. They probably wouldn't know. They just know, I just use O'Connor's. You know, I never really paid attention to the name on the book. So uh, be aware that the author of the book may be what you see. And so when you're looking at it, the author's name may not be super prominent on the spine of the book. It may not even be on the spine of the book. So if somebody says, well, you know, you want me to find Dorsanios? Can you describe what it looks like? You may want to Google it to see, see a little bit more about that. So as I said, these resources have all these cool things in them. So as you're trying to nail down a particular administrative law path, one thing you may want to do, and this is going to depend somewhat on the issue that you're being asked to look into, is you may be interested in finding the enabling statute. It's important to find that statute if you think an agency is perhaps overreached. Maybe the EPA is now trying to, or well, this is a better example, the, the Food, Food and Drug Administration might suddenly start trying to uh, regulate uh, tobacco. Well, if you look at the enabling statute, you'll see that they're not allowed to regulate tobacco. And so you could, you, you'd want to make sure that you're familiar with that statute to see well, is the agency doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, most of the time that's not an issue, uh, so it's not every time that you'll need to do that. You may, if, there, if you need to be more granular about it, is look at decisions that um, have come about from the enabling statute. How have courts interpreted that enabling statute? And then you may want to look at the regulations. Very possibly that's going to be your primary focus, finding the re regulations and perhaps also seeing how courts have interpreted that regulation. Loosely services can help you make sense of it. They're secondary sources, at least the commentary is. I guess they're a combination because they actually have the regulation, which would be a primary source. They would have the enabling statute, which would be a primary source. They'd have some court opinions, which, which would be primary sources. But they also have commentary. These commentaries, though, are really, really good. They're going to be written by subject matter experts. And uh, so they can be very helpful in you making sense of what the regulations say and also helping you find the portions of the regulations regulations that you care about. So those are some suggestions when you're dealing with administrative law. Okay, so that's the ending of our PowerPoint. Now I'm going to show you some resources that were referenced in the PowerPoint. And one was this website. This is the Code of Federal Regulations. Again, you can look at the various titles. You see these parallel. We can see Title 29 Labor. These are the same titles that we saw when we were looking at the U.S. Code. Um, and so you can look up all the labor code. Let's just click on that, go for a second. You can get more granular here. Maybe you're interested in the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and their regulations. You click on here to get more granularity. Um, okay, so then here we have, uh, Cornell has the CFR here, the Code of Federal Regulation. And again, since it's organized the same way, for Title 29, Labor, and we could, um, <coughs> we'll look at Title B, maybe we're interested in the Wage and Hour Division. We could get some things about uh, Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection. Maybe that's an interest of ours, okay? Then this is the federal government uh, register. Uh, again, this is different than the Code of Federal Regulations. This is the one that comes out like um, every day, I guess. It was uh, you know, the Daily Journal of the United States government. It shows all the regulations. Um, and so this is a little bit of a more tricky website to navigate, but you can find well, what's coming down. You can see here a little bit of information, light, light reading here. Let's say you're interested in um, See, there's uh, on uh, there's an executive order entered on Friday, providing an order of succession within the Department of the Interior. Uh, 
Pan American Day and Pan American Week was uh, also a proclamation by the by the president. And there would be uh, other uh, things that have come up. Let's see some common ones. We can see here simplifying meal service and monitoring requirements in the national school lunch and school breakfast programs. I was seeing some comments about whether uh, a white bread can be part of that school lunch program or things, things along those lines. I talked about Dorsanios. Here's where they look. This is a, a, not the best color. It's a little bit lighter than this. It's kind of blue, but it does have a little bit of the greenish. It's a little bit of an aqua e color. Um, maybe this is a bit better picture of it. Anyway, I've got it in my office if you're ever interested in looking at it. You can see it is a, a Lexus product, so we don't have access to it in, oh, this isn't the right one. This is, this is St. Clair. We want the Dorsanias one. Here we are, and you'll see William Dorsania. Yeah, Dorsania. Um, anyway, so um, kind of my office when we're back in session. Now I'm going to flip over to Westlaw. Westlaw is a huge, huge library. And I, uh, the only way to really understand how huge it is is to really explore it. And so um, I'm going to suggest that you spend maybe 30 minutes every week just kind of picking, you know, one area and tabbing on it and just looking around and seeing what you can see. Um, this is a tremendous resource that we have. If you were on private practice, this would probably cost your, you having a license to Westlaw would probably cost your law firm in excess of $200 a month. This is not an inexpensive thing. The college gets a discount because we're an educational facility, but even with that, I think we're paying $25 a month for you to have access to this. So use it. Don't let a week go by that you're not in there uh, looking at it. You, you uh, are, are, have this really tremendous gift that people in private practice would salivate at. So use it. Use it uh, regularly. Um, it, it is just a tremendously valuable resource and it will make you a much better res researcher and a much better paralegal or attorney if you uh, develop those skills. Anyway, I'm going to show you one section of it, or actually a couple sections of this. So here we are. We are at uh, our home base. We're going to click on it again. We're going to get started. So this is where we start. And we're going to um, go to secondary sources. So I'm just going to go down here. You can see I'm in the browse box. I'm going to go to secondary sources. And um, I'm going to go, we're going to, the, the, again, there's lots of different ways we can approach this. Um, but we are going to start by looking at, you can see we have encyclopedias, which actually we'll use encyclopedias um, in a second. But let's first of all, we're just going to use Texas here. We're going to click on Texas. And then we're going to see we get about two pages of stuff. Texas is fortunate in that we have, because we're a popula populated state, there's lots of books. And um, when you are in a private practice with your law firm, you may well have some of these turned on. As you can see, there are certain things that are called out of plan. You don't have to worry on accidentally clicking on something and somehow incurring a bill or anything. They won't let you go or our prescription, our prescription subscription doesn't allow you to go. We're going to look, though, at this one right here, Contract Law Texas Practice Series. Um, this is really a, almost like a textbook of contract law. This gives you a really nice overview of how contract law works. We're going to go to um, problems of formation and we're going to go down to 37 incapacity incapacity is a term if you've taken contract law you probably or will this will be familiar to you but you'll take it eventually so it's good to know there are three things in texas that can result in incapacity and it tells you right here there are three general classifications of incapacity to contract which are uh, regularly addressed by the courts intoxication minority and insanity here the word minority means underage, under the age of 18. And then it gives you an explanation about that kind of standard and it gives you links to lots of different cases so you can develop a little bit more granular understanding of that. So uh,
Then we could go maybe to the next page. Let's see here. And you can see the way to go from one page to another is just to click over here. And we'll see the next uh, section about incapacity and intoxication. And I'll talk about, well, you know, how drunk do you have to be? Or how intoxicated do you have to be? Or can you be intoxicated on illegal substances? And that uh, can count as intoxication. And then we might see here about minority. And we can see the age. Yes, it is 18 is when we achieve our majority in Texas. And so if we're interested in diving into it, we've got all these lovely cases. There are other things too we can see, briefs that might be relevant. Uh, we might want to flip, maybe we're interested, and not in this topic, and so we can browse and see other topics that might be relevant. Oh yeah, this is the one I was interested. Oh no, this is the one I'm interested in. So this is a neat little, uh, almost like a treatise on the area of contract law. There are lots of these. This is actually produced by the Texas Practice Series. And there, this I think is actually a West publication. And there are, gosh, as we go back, let me just keep on going back here. We'll probably see, uh, let me go back to that main list where we had the two pages. We'll probably see, I don't know, over 10, maybe 20. Yeah, here's. Texas Practice Guide, Texas Practice Guide. Um, so depending, Texas Practice Guide, maybe you're interested in criminal forms and trial manual. Texas Practice Guide. Um, just lots of different things that you can see here. Um, anyway. Lots of different topics of interest. To you. And of course, you're welcome to kind of jump in here and click on things and get more granular and find out more information about a particular topic that's meaning for you, meaningful for you in whatever the Texas practice series is that it yeah, speaks to your particular needs and you, we have access to them within the system. So um, now we're going to go to the second page. You can see, oh, here's, I was talking about O'Connor's before. We don't have access to O'Connor's within our subscription. Um, as I said before, uh, Westlaw doesn't have Dorsania's, but it does have O'Connor's. So here's a list of some of the O'Connor's, and the O'Connor's is in many senses very similar to D Dorsania's. So maybe you have a estate planning practice. So you would be interested in O'Connor's Texas probate forms. Uh, or maybe, and here's Tex O'Connor's Texas probate law handbook. Uh, maybe you're interested in civil litigation. Well, here's some exam examples of documents in that area. Maybe you have a criminal practice. So these might be of interest to you. We're going to flip over here and we are going to go to Texas Forms Legal and Business. And you can see they're arranged alphabetically. I'm going to see, you can see the scope of the uh, 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 matter right here by clicking on this. You can see the uh, when it was last updated and what it covers. And we're going to look at commercial code. The commercial code is a reference to the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, you'll learn more about that when you get to contracts. Uh, we're interested in section one, we're gonna go to uh, sales, which are the um, article two section, and we're gonna go to the forms. And we are going to look at the complete sales forms. We're going to look at the general forms. So if we were interested in entering into a uh, uh, UCC contract, here we have one to work from. Um, and you can see this would have all the provisions. Um, you would, in the brackets, you'd, you'd remove the bracket. Well, first of all, let me just show you what you would do. You would hit Easy Edit. it would become a Word document for you. This is RTF, so it would work in more than one database, but then you would save it as a doc. 
Oops, sorry, the wrong one. So here's our contract. And so we would, let me just blow it up so it's a little easier to see. So you would enter the date. Between, again, we read the black brackets, ABC Corporation. Maybe we are going to call that ABC going forward. And the seller is DEF Corporation. DEF. You can see how you go about editing it. Then there would be some sections that you'd probably, you can see here there's an optional section. Maybe you don't need this for your particular contract. Or there might be some provisions that don't apply to the particular deal that you've entered into. And so you would go through this and you would uh, cut things out uh, that aren't relevant or, or whatever. And so that's an example. Maybe, um, obviously you'd, you'd fill various uh, parts of it in. So this would be a starting point for your contract. Obviously you'd customize it for your own needs, but it, it, it will make, it will help you, it will save you a lot of effort because you're not drafting everything. It will give you a starting point to, to make it the deal that your client wants to enter into. And it will also help you in terms of a checklist. Oh, I forgot I would need this provision. Well, it's already here. So you don't have to remember it because somebody else has thought through all those things and come up with a contract that's gonna work for all those purposes. So let's go ahead and go back. So that's just one example of what you might do. Um, you might also be interested in, if we're doing sales, you might not be interested in a form. You might just be interested in um, learning a little bit about the topic. Maybe you have some questions about um, commercial transactions and how the UCC interacts with it. Well, then you can read commentary. Again, this is a secondary legal source. It's interpreting the UCC for you. And you see chapter two of the Texas Business and Commerce Code, that is the Uniform Commercial Code. You can pull up the statute here, but it's gonna tell you about it. It's gonna kind of make it a little bit more easy to process. Um, you could click ahead and find some additional stuff. It's also gonna cite some cases too, but you can see it's mainly the actual UCC. As we go forward, I'm sure we'll find some cases, but. Actually, not too many cases. It looks like it's pretty much the code here. So let's go back to our next, to our, our table of various and sundry resources. And we're now gonna go to um, Texas Jurisprudence. This is the encyclopedia. So if I really don't know anything about a particular area, this is probably the first place I'm gonna go. I'm gonna click on this. It literally is, let me just pull up a picture. Texas jurisprudence, so you can have a visual of what it looks like. The green. Okay, I'm gonna do this. Texture third. Ah, here we go, this is what they look like. Um, but obviously we're more interested in the online. So what we're gonna look at are um, the um, elements that are necessary to prove informal marriage. Our boss has just said, listen, we've got a client, he wants to prove up an informal marriage that he thinks he's entered into um, with his girlfriend. And so um, find out what we need to do there. Let's say this practice has nothing to, our practice usually has nothing to do with family law. I don't even know where to get started. Well, I'm gonna to go to texture and I'm probably gonna look under, I don't know, family law. And then I'm gonna look here, okay, family district courts, husband and wife, that looks like that would be relevant, okay. 
So I'm going to go to, I don't know, marriage. That looks relevant. Uh, ah, marriage without formalities. Common law marriage. Looks like I found it, right? And um, I'm going to say um, I'm interested in establishing common law marriage by proof of elements. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, Let's look at elements of common law marriage. What do we need to prove? You know, in our statutory section, we took apart that statute and found the things that we needed, and we decided there were three things, right? Well, here we have them again. The parties need, agree to be married. The parties live together in Texas after they agreed to, to be married, and the parties represented to others that they were married. And we can see a site right here, number three. Let's look down here. It's that exact same statute we looked at before. You'll see in this section, though, it's a combination of statutes and cases. So you can see here, I didn't know if, a, I, I probably thought with the term common law marriage that there wouldn't be a statute, but it took me very little time to find out about the statute. Texture is going to tell me about relevant statutes. They're also going to tell me about relevant cases. They're not going to list every case. They're not always going to list the most recent cases. My prediction is um, here, well, actually, these cases are pretty new. But oftentimes, you'll see in texture pretty darn old cases, not in this particular item, but in other items. I've seen cases back to the early 1900s. Um, but still, even having one case, because keep in mind, you can key cite it, and you can go to its uh, key numbers at the beginning, Yes, head notes and um, find other cases. So having one case or one statute really opens up everything so you can uh, find lots of other stuff. So this tells us, this gives us commentary, helps us process, because this is a secondary source, helps us process the information in the statute or the cases. So what about citing texture? Uh, Texas jurisprudence. It's a very reputable, very well-known resource. But it's also a little bit like Encyclopedia Britannica. It doesn't do a deep dive. It's designed to kind of get your big toe in the door. And so I probably wouldn't cite texture very often. Or if I were going to cite it, it would be for just a really generic statement. Like let's say there wasn't a statute in this area. I might cite this. This might be a nice summary of the com common law. And I might have a difficulty finding a statute that says it that clearly, but nobody's going to argue with this. This has been the law in Texas forever, since we became a, a republic, probably. And so um, this is, a, a, you know, what was called in the law, black letter law. Nobody's going to dispute it. Um, that's the type of thing to use Texas jurisprudence for. Um, so this is a really nice thing. So if, if you are in one of your classes and we're getting into the weeds and you're just not sure how to make sense of something, texture can be a really nice resource. Now let's say you're taking contract law and you're interested in the issue of um, uh, uh, incapacity. Let's see if we can find that. Ah, oh, look, they have a section, capacity of parties. We can look, let's say we're interested in the incapacity of minors. Let's look at that. We'll look here at the effect of a minor's disability. And when they say disability, they don't mean that the minor is, is ill, but they mean that, that the minor, because he's a minor, is not able to enter into a contract. The age of majority in Texas is 18. A child, or minor is, a child or minor is a person under age of 18 who is not and has not been married or has not had the disabilities of minority removed for general purposes. And so you can get some statutes here and also some cases that discuss what happens um, about that situation. So you get a little bit more information, but it's still at a pretty high level. It's not going to get into the weeds. So if you're taking contracts and you're not quite sure you understood about what incapacity meant, this might be a really nice source to look at. Now we're going to look at another Texas jurisprudence tool. And that is going to be the pleading section. I actually use this in another one of my classes. 
Here we go, Texas jurisprudence, pleadings in practice forms. Now we're going to look at divorce petitions. Let's say our attorney has asked us to prepare a divorce petition. And if you practice in that area generally, you're probably not coming to Texas jurisprudence for pleadings. But let's say we're not, this isn't a normal part of our practice. We're doing this as a favor for a long-term client. So we might go, let's say this is our go-to forms manual. And so we're going to go, I don't know, to family law maybe. That probably makes sense. Let me see. Maybe not family law. Let's see here. Maybe we can do divorce. Let's just click on divorce then. And so I could maybe see actions for annulment, divorce, or to declare marriage void. So I am interested in petitions. That's what we call that first document. And I might be interested in forms. And I'm interested in petitions and I'm interested in the divorce petition. So I click on that. And this gives me an example of what I might want to have in my divorce petition. Again, I can hit that easy edit button and it'll download automatically. But you might see some things here that you're like, wow, that doesn't look right. This isn't actually what the caption should look like. It's just showing you the information. You'd still need to format it. You know, it's still requiring a pretty significant amount of input. It's not just, oh, okay, I have the form, so it's, you know, easy peasy. No, it requires a lot of knowledge and skill to get everything set up just right. For example, what level of discovery are you going to need in this case? Probably level two but you have to be able to know which one of those choices is right. Um, and you're gonna have to get the social security number of the, of the individuals. And you can see you have to make a choice between these sections. Is it this four or this four, this four, this four? So obviously if it's, this is the right four, then you're gonna eliminate, you know, this section and these sections. Anything in brackets is something you're not going to keep in your final version. Service, how are you going to serve, serve it at this time? And so let's say you decide that a service is not necessary at this time. So you'd omit this and you'd omit this. And again, so you'd go through and you would, you would uh, check things out. For example, well here we're not adding the grounds for a divorce. So you need a uh, find either another form or another a set of clauses that would help you with that or you need to draft it on your own. You can see it goes on for pages and pages and pages and there's some practice notes at the end. These are some things to think about when you're doing that particular task. Let's go back here and see where we were. Going back to our divorce section. forms. Uh, so let's look under, well we'll look here to see if there is anything else. Let's look under additional alternative allegations. Ah, see here, let's say we want to allege adultery. So here is a, this might be the paragraph we insert in that previous document. So you need to kind of shop around and find all the, you know, it's a little bit like going to Kroger's, you know, you, you, you want to make lasagna. Well, you're going to have to go and find some tomatoes in the produce section and you're going to need to go to the cheese section to find some Parmesan cheese. And then you're going to have to go to the noodle section to get some lasagna and you'll have to, uh, I don't know everything you put in it, but whatever, uh, tomato sauce or something. So you'll have to go to various places. You won't just be able to go to Kroger and say, I'd like the lasagna stuff. Uh, they may have some kind of kit there too, but let's say 
you don't want that kit. Um, you, you need to kind of look around and find the shopping. So this paragraph could go nicely into the form that said, you know, add the reason for the divorce petition. So this is another example of a form that you can use. Um, let's go back to that list of documents, okay, and we can look at uh, Texas Legal Practice Forms, another resource. And uh, this time we're going to look at family law and we're going to go to chapter 15 and we're going to go to the pleadings of the petitioner. We're going to look at 14. This is a Sapser suit. A Sapser suit is a, in this case, it's a divorce petition that but because there's a child of the marriage, uh, if the child is under the age of 18, then the divorce will have to establish uh, the custody arrangements for that child. So it has a Sapser provision in addition to the divorce petition. So this is another example of a divorce petition. And again, similarly, we could use this easy edit. And we're going to see lots of different choices, you know, choose one of these or this one or that one or whatever. And again, you're going to do some comparison shopping. Again, just like you do at Kroger, you, uh, you see one can of beans, you see another can of beans, you look at the ingredients, you look at the price, um, those types of things, and then you make a choice. Well, here you can kind of go through this and say, which one do I like better? Which one fits my needs better? Which one is more uh, consistent with what uh, my client's circumstances are? So this is, again, the, an example of how that might play out. And there are notes at the end. So again, very similar to what we saw with Texas Jurisprudence Pleading and Practice Forms. And then we have one more, and we'll be done with the, uh, this website. We're going to then go to one other place and look at some things there as well. So here we're going to go to West's Texas Forms. And we're going to look at an adoption proceeding this time. So we're going to look at family law and we're going to go down here to chapter 13 and look at adoption. We're going to look at adoption for children and we're going to look at number 39, which is a petition for adoption. So again, we have that easy edit. We hit that button and it'll download it. And then we just go through and format it again. This is not the way the caption is going to look when you're done with it, but at least let you know what the information is you need to have. And you'll see which the particular things that you need for the assignment, you know, the names that you need to add. Again, you'd remove the brackets, but those brackets are just a signal to you, hey, you know, Either it's giving you information that obviously shouldn't stay in the form or it's telling you you need to add some information here. And you go through this and there's again more information that you need to add. Every paragraph is going to have some information most likely you need to add or maybe take out in some cases. And again there's other resources too. For example, uh, you can use the key numbers because this is a West resource so it's going to have things along those lines. So um, as you can see, there are lots of cool forms to think about when you're working through these, these types of things. Now we're going to do something different, though. All this time we've been in Westlaw. Now we're going to flip on over and go to practical law. The way to do that is you click up here. There's this little hat type thing, and you click on practical law. There's several different ways to get to practical law on Westlaw, um, so you're welcome to use other paths, but to me this is the easiest because this will just toggle. I want to go back to Westlaw, I go back here. So this is, you know, what I've called home base throughout the course, but now we can have, see that there's really two home bases, and we're going to look up and try to find a liquidated damages clause. I'm gonna, we're going to find it in two different ways. So again, this is an example of how we would use, if we had the loose leaf services with the books, how we'd be finding forms and uh, looking up particular things along those lines. So your, your attorney said, we need a contract. I, we have a contract. All we need is a liquidated damages provision. How are you going to find that? Well, one way to go about it is just look under here. We're in the practical law. We go to practice areas, and we're interested in commercial transactions. This is a contract. 
that's a commercial transaction. And so we go into here, and now we're going to um, uh, look at, let's see. Let me go back, just get started from the beginning. Okay, I'm sorry, I was in the wrong thing. So we're gonna go to resource types, I apologize. That would have gotten us to the same spot. Um, that would have been an, an alternative path, but I had, didn't, haven't tried that one yet, so uh, to focus here. So, we're, we, so we, we can look here at practice types, if we know our practice type, and that's the more in, uh, intuitive way for us to approach, we can do it. Or we can go to resource types, which is what we're gonna use. Or of course, we can focus on jurisdictions, which is an equally good way obviously Texas in our case. But we're gonna look at resource types and we're gonna look for standard clauses. We know this is a standard clause in contracts. We're now gonna to go to commercial transactions and we're going to type here in the search engine because you can see here there are, I don't even know how many. Yeah, you can see we have you know 800 or so. So that would take a lot of time surfing. So it makes sense. I know the terms that I need is a liquidated damages clause. Okay, so I'm going to hit search. I must, yeah, I mistyped. <laughs> Oops. Okay, and now I'm going to want to focus it on Texas. I'm going to go over here to jurisdiction and just add Texas. And you can see when I add Texas, I'm just going to get seven hits. And the very first one is called a general contract clauses liquidated damages. So here we go into this and I've got myself clause right here. I'd want to read it, make sure it's good. I could read the notes about it just to find out some more information about the things I ought to think about. But this is designed specifically for Texas and um, we can download it or we can just cut and paste it. So this is an example of a clause that we might want to use. So here is the provision. And again, this provision would be inside a much longer, long, longer contract. Let's think about it though a different way. Let's say we didn't want to go through all those clicks or we started those clicks and we got lost and we didn't kind of know what we wanted to be. So I'm gonna go back to home base. Now it's practical law home base, not Westlaw home base. And I could just type it up here. So I'm gonna type in liquidated damages clause and I'm gonna add Texas up here. And look, I get exactly the same one. So there's lots of different ways of getting it. There's probably, you know, 50 different ways of getting to the same document, all equally good. And you can do the same process for divorce petition or adoption petition or whatever the particular language is that you need. So what I've tried to show you today is that Westlaw hat provides so much stuff. And there's so many uh, ways that you can use it as a paralegal and as a, a paralegal student. Be sure to, to really take advantage of it and see, especially in the areas of forms, because well, paralegals do lots of legal research. They also work with lots of different forms. And knowing how to work with forms are not easy. In advanced legal documents prep, a course that you'll be taking later on if you're not taking this semester, you work with forms. And you might think, well, that's easy peasy. You know, you just, you just plug stuff in to the document. Um, in, in, uh, in the legal profession, it isn't that transparent. There's lots of decisions that have to be made. There's lots of things that have to be considered as you add and subtract things and format things. And so getting the practice with working with forms at this point in your career is gonna save you a lot of grief and it's also gonna increase your marketability. So those are some things to think about. I hope that this information has been helpful for you. I thank you so much for your attention. Have a wonderful day.